world, bringing with them diseases that the people of the New World had never encountered, and many of them died, not to mention being killed in the wars. So in some areas, up to 90 or more percent of the Indians died, which means all of their genetic data is gone. Um, and in some areas, they're gone altogether. If any of you have been down to Uruguay, there are no native Uruguayan Indians. They're gone. The population of Uruguay is Spanish and Italian. Uh, so if you look for any kind of genetic signature from the primitive inhabitants of Uruguay, you will find nothing. They're gone. Um, <clears throat> that didn't happen in Iceland, but it happened in the New World. Populations largely wiped out by disease, by warfare, and so on and so forth. Um, and so what you see today in, in today's American Indian populations may or may not be, almost certainly is not, representative of what the ancient DNA was, which is very hard to recover. Um, now, I mentioned Mike Whiting before. His article shows up in this. Uh, Mike Whiting uh, earned his PhD in, uh, in genetics and related fields at Cornell University. He's been the director of BYU's uh, DNA sequencing center since 1997. And his research focuses on things that are very related to the kinds of things we're talking about here, systematics, uh, molecular phylogenomics, hope you like that, That's, um, computational biology. Uh, there's simple subjects, perhaps, to the average anonymous <laughs> internet and a Mormon. But, but for most people, they're sort of complex. They require PhD study and postdocs and things like that. Um, now, just about the time this controversy began to really take wing, it was really pleasant for us uh, because he got a lot of really good publicity. His uh, DNA-related work on walking sticks, this kind of insect that, according to him, re-evolved the ability to fly about 50 million years after losing it. Uh, his study on that was featured in the 16 January 2003 issue of the journal Nature. Now, Nature, along with the journal Science, this represents the pinnacle for, for people who write in the biological and physical sciences. These are really the top-of-the-line journals. And there it was, a signal on it for a scientist to be there. And so just in time uh, for him to start speaking out on DNA issues, which he really didn't want to do, um, there he was with a lot of prestige. Um, he wrote an article called DNA in the Book of Mormon, a phylogenetic perspective. Now, he got a real kick out of the fact. I don't want to raise the issue of evolution here, but uh, Professor Whiting is an ardent Latter-day Saint and an ardent evolutionist. There are those. Um, and of course there are. I'm not going to comment personally on this subject. That's for a later time. Um, but, um, but anyway, he was delighted, more, almost more than anything else he told me, by the fact that, that here, evolution and Darwinian biology was coming to the defense of the Book of Mormon. He thought that was enormously fun. Because uh, he was going to be using his background as an evolutionary biologist and geneticist to defend the Book of Mormon. Um, and what he did was to frame the challenge of creating an experiment that could determine scientifically which Native Americans are descendants of of any of the three colonizing groups in the Book of Mormon. He said, let's imagine. See, he was serving at the time on a, on a committee of the National Science Foundation that actually evaluated DNA-related proposals, research proposals, seeking grants from the NSF. So he had a lot of experience in analyzing these grant proposals, deciding which ones had merit, which ones simply weren't scientific enough to deserve any money. And he said he tried to imagine somebody constructing uh, an NSF grant proposal to answer this question. And he said, frankly, given the present state of the science, such an experiment is impossible to design. It could not possibly win an NSF grant. It wouldn't be taken seriously <coughs> by the scientific community. Neither to prove the Book of Mormon true nor to refute it, there's not enough genetic information in the Book of Mormon to do it. You can't construct such an experiment. That was his argument. He also argued that, um, <clears throat> that if the Book of Mormon peoples come to a new world that already included pre-existing populations, their genetic signature would be, as he kept saying, swamped out. They would simply be lost among the population as they intermarried. And remember, Laman and Lendl don't seem to have had any strong scruples against marrying outside of the covenant. Uh, I can't imagine that that was really high on their list of priorities, <laughs> avoiding that. Um, okay, now another piece that appears in the book by David McClellan. It's another one. I, I just loved it. I, I decided we needed another piece on uh, on the DNA issue. And so I contacted David McClellan, who's a youngish uh, professor in the Department of Biology, Integrative Biology at BYU, whatever that is. Uh, that's a new title since my days as a student. But, uh, um, but I contacted him and he said, you know, I've always wanted to write something for farms. He said, but I couldn't imagine, given my background, what on earth would they ever have me write? I'd be delighted to write it. And he sat down and he wrote this. I don't even remember how long the thing is. It's, 
60 pages or something in the original review. He wrote it in the course of about a week. Uh, just, it gushed. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the advantages that David McClellan had, it seemed to me, over our critics, our most prominent critics, um, on the DNA issue is that he is, is actually an actual scientist who actually deals with human genetics. Um, I think that's, that's useful in a case like this. Um, let me tell you something about him. Now, it's a simple science, I grant you. Um, but um, he did a PhD in genetics at Louisiana State, and then he did a couple of postdoctoral fellowships in Japan at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, the Institute of Statistical Mathematics, and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't know why he was wasting his time when all you need is common sense, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but that's what he did. He wrote a primer on uh, the subject of, as he put it, detecting Lehi's genetic signature, possible, probable, or not. And he offers a, 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 a to me, very challenging, uh, but basic, essential overview of the biology that's relevant to uh, serious discussion of questions relating to DNA. He was very conscious about this. He said, people need to understand, you need to know this stuff before you can even address the question. So he lays it out at some length, and, and I have to admit, I found it a, a tough ride. Um, even though he's trying to be basic, it's hard. Um, but that's part of the point of it. I thought that was important to make that point to people. This is not easy. And at the conclusion of it, he says, he does not expect to find, quote, an Israelite genetic presence in Central America, perhaps as far away as Arizona to the north and Colombia to the south. He says, this is just not, it's, it's possible, but it's so unlikely as to not even re really be worth considering. Um, and he says, it's not because they weren't there. He says, I'm assuming they were. But you just, we don't have any of the information we need to find them, um, or to recognize, if we did find them, what we were looking at. <coughs> He points out that uh, proper interpretation of Native American population genetic data in the context of LDS claims about ancient migrations to the Americas of a few families from the Middle East requires a preliminary understanding of several pretty important, fairly complex concepts, including the scientific method, basic genomics and genetics, molecular evolution, population genetics, genealogical inference from molecular data, all these simple things that most of us just kind of grow up with, you know. Um, and he tries to lay this out in layman's terms to evaluate the current status of Native American genetic data in the light of these concepts in order to, uh, to evaluate the plausibility of the Book of Mormon storyline. His general conclusion is that although it might be possible, in theory, to recover the genetic signature of a few migrating families from 2,600 years ago, it's just highly improbable. Um, we just, you know, when you try to find the, the, the DNA of individual people, that's basically what we're talking about here, from 2,600 years ago, 26 centuries ago, and remember in Iceland they can't find them 150 years ago. This is just not, this is not a practical thing. But he does say, the data suggests there has been a trickle of gene flow to the New World from non-Asiatic source populations. So this doesn't prove the Book of Mormon, doesn't verify it, but it does certainly suggest there's some other things going on out there. We don't know exactly what they are. Because if we hadn't found any of that, it still wouldn't prove the Book of Mormon false, but the fact that we have found some non-Asiatic gene sources suggests, yeah, the, the standard picture may be true overall, but there are other little side stories going on, smaller stories going on, that we may never be able to recover fully. Two more authors for this book, D. Jeffrey Meldrum, who is an associate professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State, earned a PhD at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Trent Stevens, his co-author, also at Idaho State, is a professor of anatomy and embryology, got a PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. And they, they wrote an article called, Who are the Children of Lehi? And they focused on questions touching on the descendants of Lehi and Sariah, trying to answer that question. One of their chief points has to do with, um, with traceable genetic characteristics that a person inherits from distant ancestors. And they just look at straightforward genealogical research, and they show that the chance of scientifically tracing a person's genetic heritage by DNA alone is very, very low. It's highly remote. It just almost can't be done. And uh, so they say this has dramatic consequences for anyone who thinks that they can uh, identify the descendants of the Lamanite survivors from the wars of the fourth century AD. It's just, you, you cannot press a scientific method beyond what it's capable of doing. And in the initial flush of excitement when you discover it, you think it can do everything. But in fact, it can't. Uh, and in some of these cases, it's not just that we're limited by the current state of the science. In some of these cases, we are limited because we just don't have the data in the Book of Mormon. We never will until the millennium or something. 
Uh, and it doesn't matter how refined our tests become. The data isn't there. It's like what we've discovered with multispectral imaging with other aspects of the work at uh, the Maxwell Institute. We can recover a damaged text if the text is, text is there, but sometimes it's not there. We've come across uh, texts where 